Um, so let me start with our mission statement. Uh, the Rubin Observatory's mission is to build a well understood system that provides a vast astronomical data set for unprecedented discovery of the deep and dynamic universe. And the words I want to emphasize in this mission are well understood system. The science that uh, we hope to carry out with LSST is very demanding. It's sensitive to systematics and it's sensitive to uh, our having calibrated and understood all aspects of the system, both, both the hardware systems and telescope and the camera, but also the data management system. And so a key element of this project is not to just construct the observatory, but to um, understand all the components, their as-built performance. Uh, and you'll hear a lot about that as we go along, both for the commissioning plans, and then we have a particular talk, which will be given by Jelko Ivicic, who's the deputy director and project scientist, on what our current understanding of the, of the performance of the system is. So those, with, those of you who've been with us before um, uh, may have noticed the name change. Uh, so we now refer to this project as the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Uh, that change in name was um, actually enacted by as an act of Congress and it formally took effect in January of 2020. Um, Vera C. Rubin, for those of you who are not familiar with, it, with her, was a, a, a very famous uh, American astronomer uh, who played a very significant role in developing our current view of, of dark matter in the universe, which is one of the major mysteries of, of modern physics. She received a certain amount of uh, attention during her lifetime, but, but in, in the view of many, not as much attention as, as she should have uh, received. And um, so we we're quite honored actually to have the project named after her. Uh, formally, that name applies to uh, the overall project, its facilities in Chile and Tucson. Um, and it is the principal name that we go by in the future. As Victor will highlight, we're, we're still developing a logo for the new name, but that should be available fairly soon. At the same time as we enacted that name, we decided to formally rename the telescope itself as the Simone Survey Telescope. Uh, this is in recognition of Charles Simone, who's depicted at the right, that's a picture of Charles. And he named it um, in particular uh, in, in recognition of his father who is shown to the left of him. Uh, so the name Simone Survey Telescope refers to the telescope itself, not to the rest of the observatory. And then the LSST name, uh, you know, there's a lot of documentation which has LSST indications on it, et cetera, and the logo you, you may recognize. We wanted to keep that name in some form. And so we redefined what the letter stood for. So they used to stand for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And we renamed the actual survey, the 10 year survey that we'll do with this project as the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which uh, was kind of a clever uh, uh, reacronym, reacronymization or whatever it is. Um, in that that's quite an apt dis, uh, description of what our, what our survey is. So the, the actual 10 year survey that will be performed by the Rubin Observatory uh, is called LSST, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. The facility as a whole is called the Rubin Observatory and the telescope itself is called the Simone Survey Telescope. Uh, on the DOE side, we decided to retain the name LSST CAM for the camera as the MIE project. Um, and you can view the LSST in that name now as Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So uh, let me start with the slide that I, I normally use to just describe what LSST is or what the Rubin Observatory is. It's an integrated survey system which is designed to you know, carry out this 10 year survey what we call a deep, wide, fast time domain survey of the entire southern hemisphere of sky. And we do that using an eight meter class wide field ground-based telescope, a three billion pixel camera, and a highly automated and advanced data processing system 
to, uh, to uh, handle all of the very large volume of data that will be produced. And then finally, there's a public engagement platform uh, for our EPO program, Education Public Outreach, uh, which fulfills the, um, the need on the NSF side for a broader context for, for this large construction project. So as I mentioned, for the first 10 years of operation, the Rubin Observatory will perform the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST, using the LSST camera and the Simone Survey Telescope. And during this time, we will acquire, process, and make available something like 5 million images. Each of those images will be 3 billion pixels. Uh, and those images will yield catalogs of astronomical sources, which will number up to, at the end of 10 years, about 37 billion objects, so about 20 billion galaxies and 17 billion stars. And something like seven trillion sources, where a source is defined as an object that was at some point uh, detected at some point in the sky at some point in time. Uh, and uh, one of the big science topics for the Rubin Observatory is the study of the time changing universe or the time variable universe. Uh, and in fact, there'll be tens of billions of time domain events, what we call time domain events which are indications that something in the sky has changed at some point in time. Uh, and we will uh, detect all of those changes, those events, and alert them uh, to the broad worldwide community in real time, within 60 seconds, actually. So as you can imagine, a survey with this, um, uh, this, this broad and this wide um, would, will enable a, a, a wide variety of complementary scientific investigations that all utilize the same database and alert stream. Uh, Tony Tyson, our project scientist, termed that many years ago as massively parallel astrophysics. And that's the way we view it. We produce one data set that will serve many, many different kinds of science uh, investigations. In this sense, Rubin Observatory is more like an experiment than a classical observatory. And so the range of science includes searches for small bodies in the solar system, precision astrometry of the outer regions of the galaxy, systematic monitoring for transient phenomena in the sky. And as you know, this project is jointly supported by NSF and DOE. And the reason DOE is involved is because uh, Rubin Observatory will provide crucial constraints on our understanding of the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Uh, so this is a kind of just generic uh, view of, of what it is. The, uh, the observatory consists of multiple components, this 8.4 meter uh, diameter telescope, a 3 billion pixel camera, and then this intricate uh, data processing system, which goes from the raw images through the developments of catalogs and onto a, a, a science and public user interfaces that allow the community to access the data in a very broad way. Uh, so as I've mentioned several times, the science is quite broad, um, but uh, in order to define um, the requirements, the technical requirements on the subsystems, uh, early on in the project, we adopted four major themes. Uh, and those were understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy, and that is through uh, using weak gravitational lensing, baryon acoustic oscillations, which is a kind of standard ruler technique, and uh, looking at supernovae and uh, active uh, galaxies through strong lensing in order to constrain the fundamental cosmological parameters. A second major theme was cataloging small bodies in the solar system. Uh, a big piece of this includes potentially hazardous asteroids, which could impact the Earth, um, as well as uh, more distant objects like Kuiper Belt objects and, uh, uh, and comets and other things. Um, studying the structure and formation of the Milky Way, the evolutionary history of the Milky Way. This comes from a str precision astrometry of of various different uh, stellar kinds of objects, which, which gives us absolute distances, uh, spatial maps of stellar characteristics, uh, and we'll get quite far out into the galactic halo for this study. 
and detect things like uh, uh, streams of stars which were formed from satellite galaxies that fell into the Milky Way over cosmic time. And then finally, exploring the transient optical sky. Uh, and this is includes objects, ordinary objects like variable stars, but also um, uh, transient objects like supernovae, uh, gamma ray bursts, other kinds of variables. Um, this, the, the optical sky is surprisingly unexplored for time variable phenomena just because most previous telescopes were not set up to survey large parts of the sky uh, relatively quickly, which is important for finding rare objects. Uh, and we hope this is an area, a key area of discovery space for the Rubin Observatory in that we expect that there are new classes of transient objects out there. And most of these, uh, these topics and how they drive the reference design, we published a number of years ago in this paper, which Jelko was the, the first author on, um, that you can get from the archive that shows the flow down of those requirements. So we collected those science requirements into a, a governing science requirements document. Uh, this was formally adopted in July of 2011 and actually it's been unchanged since that time. It is under change control and we have not needed to change it because the performance of the system uh, has remained basically up to our design and goal criteria largely. So there has been no relaxation of any science requirements despite the fact that we're more than 90% finished with the construction of the project. Uh, in any case, this is under change control. Its approval requires uh, any changes to it requ would require approval of various governing bodies. Um, the SRD uh, provides a minimum specification and design specification and stretch goals for all of our key parameters of the survey. And in most cases, uh, we made the design specifications at least, and in some cases, the stretch goals. You'll hear more about this later. Um, there are a couple of parameters where, at, where we're, we are at the minimum specification. So this is a high level summary of the requirements. It's not the complete set of requirements, but it gives you an idea. Uh, we will cover a minimum of 18,000 square degrees of sky, which is essentially the entire Southern hemisphere. Uh, each part of that sky will be visited a minimum of 825 times, where a visit uh, consists of a pair of 15 uh, second exposures separated by a four second interval when we open, when we close the shutter, read out the camera and reopen again. Uh, those 825 visits will be distributed over six separate colors which are defined by optical filters uh, in astronomical language, UGRIZY, which go from uh, 320 nanometers out to beyond one micron. Uh, LSST goes quite deep. Our single visit limiting magnitudes, as you can see, are around 23, 24th uh, in all of those bands. Uh, a very important element of the science is our photometric calibration. And we've set quite tight constraints on that, 2% uh, absolute and half a percent repeatability in comparisons of measurements made in different filters. Um, and, and that's challenging and that's governed a lot of the design criteria. Um, the state of the art at the time we started this project was more like 2% repeatability. And so we were trying to do quite a bit better than that. Um, we, uh, the, um, the median delivered image quality that we've adopted is 0.7 arc seconds. That's dominated, of course, by the seeing due to the atmosphere, uh, but it translates into a requirement on the contribution of the, uh, the, the parts of the system we're in control of, the telescope imaging performance, the camera, et cetera, uh, and even the dome seeing within the dome we have an upper limit to that contribution of 0.4 arc seconds, which gets added in quadrature with the, with the C. Um, as I mentioned, we release these alerts of transient events to the community. Uh, we have a requirement that we do that within 60 seconds of closing the shutter. Uh, that's a tight requirement on latency, processing latency, getting the data back to the US where we do the processing 
uh, doing the analysis and being able to issue these alerts. So that's quite a demanding requirement for the data management system. And then uh, every year we will issue annual data releases, which will be a full processing of all of the survey data that have been acquired to that date. So after the first year, we'll, we'll pro reprocess the uh, commissioning data as well as the first year's worth of data, and the second year, the first and second year, third year, the, the first, second, and third, et cetera. So the, the volume uh, of data to be processed increases linearly with time over the 10 years of the project. Uh, this is a plot showing you the four filter bands. So the dotted line at the top is the atmospheric transmission. Um, and then you see the uh, contributions of the filters themselves, as well as the efficiencies uh, for reflections in the telescope and, uh, and in the camera, et cetera. Uh, so this is uh, U-G-R-I-Z-Y uh, covering the full visible spectrum. Um, in terms of uh, the products that we will produce through our data management, management system, there are three main areas that drive the DM program. Uh, first off, the issuing of what we call these prompt data products, which uh, are the, you know, yield the alerts within 60 seconds. So these use image differencing pipelines. So the, the image that has been taken or the, the pair of images in a given visit uh, is differenced against the reference image for that part of the sky, and the changes are then detected. Um, we're expecting a stream of about 10 million time domain events per night uh, that are transmitted to distribution networks, again, within 60 seconds of closing the shutter. Uh, the images, uh, the objects, and source catalogs that are derived from this difference imaging um, will be dominated actually by solar system objects, by asteroids. And so in order to distinguish truly variable, variable cosmic sources from solar system sources, we have to keep track of the solar system bodies. And so we have a moving object pipeline which will detect that something is an asteroid or a comet or something else. And there'll be about six million solar system bodies um, at this magnitude limit of 24th, which applies to much, most of our band. Uh, and, um, and we will determine those orbits within 24 hours so that um, one can discern that a given object at a given place is either a, a cosmic source or, or an asteroid or some other solar system object. And of course, the idea behind this is to enable the discovery and rapid follow-up of time domain events, as I talked about earlier. Uh, the second major piece, is, piece involves the annual data release project uh, products. Uh, over the 10 years, the catalogs will, as I said, get up to about 37 billion objects and 7 trillion sources. We're expecting 11 data releases uh, released annually over the 10 years of operation. And these need to be easily accessible uh, via these user interfaces, which we call the Rubin Science Platform for the professional community. Uh, and then there'll be education public outreach uh, platforms, which are more accessible for the, the general uh, uh, layperson. Uh, and these uh, platforms will be run by what we call data access centers. There are currently two that are planned as part of the project one in the US and the other in Chile. And then a lot of the science that will come from LSST will not be just simply um, uh, reading results out of the catalogs or from the images, but will involve uh, user-generated data products, which are specific to the investigations that they're carrying out. And we have a requirement that our data management system should facilitate uh, the generation of uh, user data products by the community, which in some case, cases can be federated with our data streams. Uh, and so we need uh, to provide services and computing resources at our data access centers and by our platform to facilitate these user generated data, data products. And about 10% of our budgeted computing resources for our data facility will be allocated uh, for this purpose. So let me make a few comments about 
the physical design of LSST. The optical design is rather unique. We call it a modified Paul Baker uh, three mirror optical design. That term, it's not exactly a Paul Baker, so it's um, we're, we're using that term a little bit liberally. Uh, but it does involve three, three reflective surfaces in the telescope. So the light comes in, reflects off the primary mirror, mirror which is an annulus, on into a convex uh, secondary, and then on into a tertiary. And the tertiary, as you can see, is nearly coplanar with the primary. So we chose to make the primary tertiary combination, what we call M1, M3, out of a single monolithic substrate. And then the light goes on into the camera, which sits just below the secondary. And there are three refractive optics of the camera uh, that complete the optical system. So all this was designed together. Um, the uh, actual reflective surfaces, all three mirrors, and in addition, six degrees of freedom, uh, orientation freedom for the camera, are controlled by an active optic system. So our system is designed to read out wave fronts at the same time we're, we're acquiring images and then to adjust those mirror figures and the alignments and orientations in order to maintain the highest optical quality. Um, the, the three refractive optics in the camera have rather modest optical power. Uh, their main role is to correct uh, for the chromatic aberrations, which would be introduced by the existence of a, a window to the doer that houses the detectors. Uh, and so we have to take that out. And so we design this as one system. And then once we, we put this together, we optimize the design to reduce asphericity in the various elements, uh, which ease both the testing and the fabrication. But all these optics are now complete. So this is mostly history about that concern. The telescope mount um, is specifically designed to enable the fact that it's moving several degrees every 30 seconds or so. So we needed a compact stiff structure uh, which could achieve the short slew time and settling time. We have an upper limit of four seconds uh, for the interval of time after slewing at which we should be ready to take the next exposure. Uh, and so you can, as you can imagine, that requires a very compact and stiff telescope. Uh, and in fact, that telescope is constructed. This is a, a photograph you can see on the right. Uh, it was developed uh, in, in Spain by a consortium of Spanish uh, companies uh, and, and verified in the factory in Spain. Uh, then it was disassembled and shipped to the summit. Uh, that occurred at the time of our last status review last summer. Uh, all of the telescope components are now in Chile, and we were partially underway with reconstructing the telescope when we got hit by COVID, and I'll come back to that again. So you can see the design. This picture goes back a number of years and the actual physical reality of the telescope. Uh, the camera, as I mentioned, is a 3 billion pixel uh, camera. It, we believe it will be the largest electronic camera ever built for ground-based astronomy. Uh, as I mentioned, there are six optical filters, five of which are resident in the camera on any given night. The sixth filter, this is just geometry, being able to fit them all. The sixth filter can be uh, exchanged for any one of the five during the day. Normally, the sixth filter is the U filter, which we would only use during dark time. So when we get to the, the few days per month when we're in dark time, we would replace one of the longer wavelength filters with the U filter. Uh, the mechanisms that control the filter are all designed to make this easy uh, and, uh, and have been proven out. This is a schematic of the focal plane. Uh, so each of the uh, red uh, squares that you see here is what we call a raft. Each of the blue squares is an individual 4K by 4K CCD. And we assemble them into groups, three by three groups, which we call the rafts, which are shown at the left. So this is uh, uh, one of these rafts that makes up the focal plane. At the corners, there are four uh, corner rafts, we call them, which carry the wavefront sensors and the guide sensors. Um, so each of these, uh, these blue squares is a uh, 16 uh, megapixel uh, 
camera if you like and uh, so the the um, uh, the red squares are 144 megapixel cameras and uh, there's the electronics to read out those CCDs, digitize the data, et cetera, are all contained in the footprint of the sensors themselves. So we accomplished the assembly of this focal plane by mosaicing these rafts. Any of the rafts can go into any of the slots and we can remove any one of the rafts without disturbing the others should we need to replace. Uh, a defective raft during operations. We don't expect that to happen, but we have the capability to do that. Uh, and in fact, the complete set of sensors and the assembly of the focal plane uh, was finished last year in January. And this is a photograph of the fully assembled focal plane for LSST, which we're quite proud of. Uh, so I talked about the data management system, just getting the data to the US uh, is a major element of this. We have redundant paths uh, all the way from uh, uh, La Serena, which is the nearest city, uh, to the facility in Chile, uh, to our processing center, which is currently at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Illinois. Uh, one path um, goes basically uh, through Brazil into Miami and then to Illinois. And there's a second path that goes around the left coast. Uh, one of our paths is fully dedicated. Um, it's a 100 gigabit uh, capability, fully dedicated to LSST. And then our redundant paths utilize some shared services. Uh, so the processing of the data will involve a petascale supercomputing system uh, on the, uh, at the data archive facility which will process the raw data, generate the reduced image products, time domain alerts and coatings. And this is the kind of output you can expect to see, the image of a galaxy of multiple different color bands. Uh, and the data access centers in both the US and the Chile will enable the users to easily um, interact with those very large catalogs to perform the analysis that they want to carry out. Uh, our data processing system is in a reasonably advanced state. Uh, we call it the LSST stack. Uh, we've been using it on precursor data sets to date to evaluate its performance against other, other kinds of image processing systems that are available in, in the community. So this shows a reprocessing of the famous Stripe 82, which was acquired by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and this shows a, a more recent image taken with the Hyper Supreme camera on the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. Uh, and this, this is a GRI image of a particularly well-observed field. And it's of interest because uh, this goes about as deep as the 10-year survey with um, Rubin Observatory will go. So you can see at, at this very powerful facility after 10 years, the just enormous complexity in these images. This is a tiny fraction of the LSST field. And we will have this kind of information uh, over the entire Southern Hemisphere of sky. And that's why this facility is so powerful. So let me, uh, just a few slides on programmatics. Um, I think most of you are aware that this is a joint NSF uh, Department of Energy project. Uh, the NSF is responsible for the, or is funding the development of the telescope and flight facility construction, the data management system, and the education and public outreach components. That is in the form of a $473 million uh, major research and facility construction project. Uh, the cooperative agreement holder for that award is ORA, the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy. Uh, our headquarters for that effort, effort is based in Tucson, and much of the activity right now is occurring in Chile. The camera fabrication uh, is being funded by the Office of High Energy Physics through the DOE Office of Science. Um, that's done as a major item of equipment uh, project. The baseline cost for that is 168 million. Uh, and the host laboratory, the lead laboratory for that effort is Slack National Accelerator Lab. Uh, and then early on, we benefited by some private money, which was quite important 
to develop some of the long lead, lead items like the primary tertiary mirror. We procured the secondary mirror blank. We did some early site preparation and some early sensor studies. That money was collected by a number of sources. Most importantly, the Simone Foundation, which is uh, why we're honoring uh, uh, Charles Simone with the, with the telescope name. It amounted to about $30 million or so and was collected by a nonprofit organization called LSST Corporation and made available to the project. This is our project organizational structure. It's changed a little bit in the last year, but not uh, substantially. As I mentioned, I'm the director of the overall project. Uh, my deputy director, Jelko Ivicic, who you hear from tomorrow, he's at the University of Washington. Our project manager is Victor Krabendam. Uh, Jelko doubles as the project scientist, and Victor has two deputies, Will O'Malley, who uh, is uh, a de deputy for software and for integration uh, for uh, IT technology, and uh, Vincent Rio, who's the project manager for the, for the DOE camera, uh, is also a deputy to Victor for the overall project. And then there are four major construction elements of the project the data management system, the camera, the education public outreach system, and the telescope in sight. Uh, so this is a schedule of where we were with the project, and I call this pre-COVID. So this is the schedule at the time before COVID hit us in a serious way. So roughly at the end of February of 2020. Um, and at that point, we had 4.75 months of contingency, schedule contingency or float left on the project. And we were making good progress to hold this schedule. And so you'll hear more about that as we go forward. Um, not surprisingly, it's been an eventful year. Uh, there were uh, three major uh, elements. Uh, first off, in the fall of 2019, um, there were a number of incidents involving civil unrest in Chile, um, which actually threatened to have a significant impact on the project. There were closures of roads that were critical access roads for us. Uh, this was obviously of concern to our staff based in Chile um, and um, how we were gonna proceed into the future had an uncertainty introduced by that. Uh, then of course the COVID crisis hit in late February. For those of you less aware, Chile was not heavily affected at the beginning of the crisis, but became very seriously affected later. Uh, right now, the um, number of cases uh, per capita in Chile is among the highest in the world. It's actually higher than the US. And so there were um, you know, serious curtailments of activity in Chile uh, due to COVID, and that put the project on hold. You'll hear more about that as we go on. And then more recently, the killing of George Floyd and the resulting, as well as others, and the resulting attention to anti-Black racism in all facets of life in America, um, you know, took over the country, uh, including our project. This, this did have significant impact on the project. Um, a number of our staff uh, took off a day in, uh, in terms of uh, strike, uh, uh, nationwide strike uh, to combat anti-Black racism. And that's caused us to rethink elements of our project culture. And so that's had a big effect as well. And let me just comment since I raised that topic on the general issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've always had programs for this, of course, but the, the recent events have, have prompted us to look more clearly or closely at our own culture, our own practices, and evaluate ways in which those may have been exclusionary to, to members of certain ethnic groups, and in particular to African Americans. Uh, some of our staff are members of what's called the Multi-Messenger Diversity Network. Uh, so that's um, broadly in astrophysics as well as in elements of particle astrophysics that are now focusing more clearly on looking at increasing equity, diversion, and inclusion in the field. Uh, and then Aura uh, appointed fairly recently a new chief diversity officer. 
Amira McBride, who, who is an attorney with a lot of experience in this field. Uh, and she's been uh, helping us as well as other aura centers to uh, look at our practices for broadening participant participation, uh, particularly for performance ass assessment. She's helping with our annual diversity, equity, and inclusion report uh, and um, uh, enhancing uh, our understanding of unconscious bias in recruitment processes. Uh, we also have a set of workplace culture ad advocates. There are six of them now. Uh, and their activity, which has evolved over the years, is to help us as a team, a multi-institutional team, to address questions of culture and, uh, you know, not just diversity, but also general issues of bullying and other kinds of counterproductive behavior. Uh, and they're representatives of various different elements of the project. So Sandrine is our telescope and site project scientist. She's based in Tucson. Uh, Richard is a senior staff scientist at Slack, who's been involved with camera software systems. Chuck Gessner is our head of safety, also based primarily in Tucson, but frequently in Chile. Andy Connolly is based at the University of Washington. Uh, he's our simulation scientist involved in the data management effort. Uh, Carol Chirino is in La Serena in Chile. She's our administrative manager at the La Serena office. And Felipe Dariuch is a senior electronics engineer also based in Chile. So we've tried to collect these people from the different sites where work on LSST or Rubin Observatory is occurring and have them interact with one another and help us as an overall institution. So let me conclude by just saying that the Rubin Observatory construction was nearing completion uh, when COVID hit. Uh, we were not without issues, but, but we believe that our technical and programmatic progress was strong. And, and we now, of course, are facing significant and uncertain delays. Um, nevertheless, we're trying to maintain our focus and devise new strategies to minimize the impacts as best we can. Uh, our team remains strongly committed to the project and to getting back to full capability. Uh, we believe that Rubin Observatory is a paradigm changing facility and we are all proud to be part of that effort uh, to make it a reality.